good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are i'm josie thomas i lead the bioenergy program of unido a warm welcome to all participants to this webinar on scaling renewable based clean cooking deep dive on bioethanol this webinar is a joint effort by the international energy agency renewable energy agency irena united nations industrial development organization unido and the council on ethanol clean cooking or cecc we have a tight agenda ahead of us with a brief opening session followed by two panel discussions these panelists will deliberate on two important questions how does the bioethanol fit into national clean cooking strategies and what experiences are emerging from building sustainable supply chains and strengthening local enterprises without much ado um uh, we are getting into uh, our ag agenda today i am pleased to invite ms utte kolier the deputy director knowledge policy and finance center of irena to give a welcome remark and introduce the context of the webinar thank you josie and good afternoon from abu dhabi it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this first webinar of what is a series of virtual knowledge exchange uh, webinars which is being organized by us here at irena on advancing renewable space clean cooking solutions now i'm sure all of you on this uh, in this webinar are, are aware of of the situation regarding sdg7 universal access uh, to clean cooking services by 2030 of course we are very far away from this target According to the latest SDG 7 tracking report, uh, which was published last year in June, and a new one is out soon, there are around 2.4 billion people still without access to clean cooking fuels and technologies. That was the 2020 figure, won't be very different for 21, 22. Under a business as usual scenario, we still expect that about a quarter of the world's people will be lacking access to clean cooking in 2030. In sub-Saharan Africa, the absolute number of people without access to clean cooking is in fact increasing rather than falling because of the issue of, of growing population. So this is a very significant problem and you're all aware of how what the impacts are in terms of health, in terms of environment, deforestation, etc. We do urgently need to change. We need a transformative shift in all sorts of things, political commitment, funding flows, solutions. Otherwise, the SDG 7 target will remain unfulfilled and that will have a, a massive cost to, to many, many people. And of course, as we explore the solutions and you know, governments define national plans and strategies, we also have to be conscious how the solutions would help us meet the, the other urgent goals we need, need to meet globally. You know, the, obviously the climate goals and hence we need to, to think about how, even though the, the currently you know, some of the solutions, even if they're fossil fuel based, won't make a big contribution to carbon emissions. If possible, we want to have solutions which are kind of future proofed. Um, and, you know, from our point of view, re renewables clearly are, uh, make a really important uh, contribution. So renewables in terms of biogas and bioethanol, which we're talking about today, but of course also renewables-based electric cooking. 
But we do find that in the current discourse on clean cooking solutions, there isn't that much attention on renewables based solutions. Um, people generally talk about clean cooking broadly and sure that's important, but we do feel that there, there are, we've seen a lot of uh, advances in the last few years, not, not just on electric cooking around which there is quite a lot of buzz, but also on biodigesters and bioethanol. There's a great deal of innovation on the way to make the solutions affordable and tailored to end user needs. And of course, those, the benefits go well beyond just the provision of clean cooking fuels and can be linked closely to issues like agricultural development, waste management and environmental conservation. So that made us think it would be really good to bring together the community to discuss some of these issues. Um, and we've decided to launch this virtual uh, knowledge exchange series. So there will be a number of other ones following this one where we'll have some solution deep dives. And after this one, the next one will be on biodigesters. And then we'll also have a broader discussion on, on how to move things forward. So in this first one, we decided to partner with UNIDO and the Council on Ethanol Clean Cooking to get more uh, an in-depth um, examination of how we've progressed on bioethanol. Because bioethanol has of course existed for a long time, but it has more recently attracted interest with the emergence of several private sector players, who also work with farmers and communities to do local supply chains. So in today's session, we're very lucky to have secured the participation of um, some of these very innovative players and we hear their story and how they've managed to progress things. We will also hear from representatives from government uh, how they see bioethanol fitting into the clean cooking landscape and strategies and financing institutions to highlight what role they see for bioethanol as part of a wider clean cooking strategy. So I would really like everyone, um, both the, the panelists, but also all the participants uh, for, for joining us today. And I look forward to an engaging discussion. I'll be back with you in the second session, which I'll be moderating. Thank you. Thank you, Ute. Uh, now we have Mr. Gustave Aboa. He is the interim chairman of the Council on Ethanol Clean Cooking, which was launched uh, during COP27 in Egypt last November by uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Madagascar, and Mali. Uh, Mr. Aboa is also the Director General of the uh, Sustainable Development at the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development of Cote d'Ivoire. Mr. Abua. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jussi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good, good, good evening to all participants from where you are. I'm delighted to announce the first event of the Council of Ethanol Clean Cooking, a virtual knowledge exchange series entitled Advancing Renewable Based Clean Cooking Solution. Solution Deep Dive on Biochannel in collaboration with IRENA. I'm grateful to UNIDO for hosting the Council Secretariat and extend a warm welcome to both current, current and prospective member of the Council. The Council is the outcome of an expert group meeting on clean cooking potential for biochannel industry in high impact country from 20 country from Africa and Asia held in June 2021 in Vienna organized by UNDO, Clean Cooking Alliance, African Union Commission, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, the Global Bioenergy Partnership and the Sustainable Energy for All. The expert group adopts a call for action 
to establish a multi-stakeholder platform to promote ethanol as a clean cooking fuel and the governance framework for the Council was developed by a working group consisting of Cote d'Ivoire, India, Kenya, the Philippines, and development partners such as the IEA, IEA Biofuture Platform, FAO Global Bioenergy Partnership, and C for All. The Council was officially launched at COP27 in Egypt by high-level government representative from Mali, Côte d'Ivoire, Madagascar, and Kenya. Kenya. The Council is a multi-stakeholder platform comprising developing country member, industry association, research and development institution, and development partner, as well as expert who share knowledge, technology, business model, and experience, including best practices to create a sustainable ethanol industry and associate value chain in member country to meet the demand of clean and affordable fuel for cooking. It engages with developing country, particularly those with majority of people still utilize traditional biomass fuel to increase the awareness, capacity strengthen, the ambition and led them to, to uh, achieving SDG 7 goal and meeting uh, national determining uh, commitment. Many developing countries have the potential for vibrant agriculture sector, which can stimulate an industrial value chain for ethanol production and thereby its bioeconomy within the framework of circular economy, circular and bioeconomy and zero waste concept. The development of an ethanol industry will stimulate local economic growth and job creation, leading to increased income for farming community and supporting overall economic development, which is also environmental, environmentally sound. The Council supports member country in their effort to develop a fuel grid ethanol industry and associate value chain from locally product, produced industrial crops and to create a market for ethanol as clean cooking fuel. If you are not member, if you are not yet a member, I take this opportunity to invite you to join us in building a sustainable ethanol industry and be part of this multi-stakeholder network with a goal to achieve sustainable uh, SDG 7 by 2030. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Abowa. Next. I would like to invite Mr. Alois Malanga, Chief of Climate Technology in Innovation Unit, representing UNIDO, to make his remark. Thank you, Josie, and uh, good um, morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. On behalf of UNIDO, we are quite excited to co-host this uh, deep dive on bioethanol. Is a UN agency that is mandated to promote and accelerate inclusive and sustainable industrial development. Our resort, the ETRE, in the bioenergy space is built on the fact that most of the agro processing industries in developing countries, in, they produce huge volumes of waste on one end, but also to recognize the fact that for electricity and uh, for, for electricity, I mean, for their energy use to a large extent includes bioenergy in one form or the other. So there's really need, industry can on one, on, on one side provide solutions to the bioenergy space, but also uh, they can also adopt new technologies to solve uh, the challenges of energy access. Our bioenergy program is, um, uh, I mean, is built uh, 
uh, is focused on supporting agro industries, enhancing the agro industrial waste for producing electricity and process heat, as well as uh, supporting our member states in creating biofuel industry and the associated uh, value chain. And uh, we are quite excited that within our bioenergy pro program, we have uh, we are implementing the global impact program for clean cooking that focuses on creating alternative fuels to charcoal, fuel hood, such as ethanol and biogas and biomass pellets industries and associated value chains. It is expected to work uh, with at least 20 countries under this program. In, as you are aware, we launched the Council for Clean Cooking, uh, I mean, the Council of Ethanol Clean Cooking at COP27 in, with, uh, in collaboration with Mali, uh, Ivory Coast, Madagascar, and Kenya. And we are happy that this event is a follow up of that. We also invite other countries to, to join this Council for Clean Cooking. Given the fact that uh, we have, uh, we don't have much time for my opening remarks, I just wanted to, to conclude by by sharing with you some thoughts on how we can scale up um, investments, but also the whole issue of uh, ethanol clean cooking in Africa and also in the other developing countries. And uh, for this, I wanted to sort of um, focus on innovation as an accelerator in terms of policies. Uh, but of course, I mean, systems innovation, that is, if we are to have uh, clean cooking at a scale and pace that is transformational, we need to ad adopt an, I mean, a, a systems innovation approach in, into this space. To begin with, we need to innovate across policies, across regulations, but also across institutions. Uh, what kind of policies and kinds of regulations would speed up the, the deployment of clean cooking uh, I mean, solutions in developing, in developing countries? But also we need to innovate around finance. In reading the latest report, it shows that Africa attracted around 6.5 billion US dollars into the startups in Africa. And of course, I had put my money around 12 billion US dollars, but uh, for, of this 6.5 billion US dollars, not much is going to clean cooking. So if we are to attract finance, if we are to innovate around finance, we need to attract as much and different kind of financing from, I mean, equity, debt to grants, to ensure that the entrepreneurs, the innovators around, uh, I mean, around this uh, clean cooking space are supported so that they can go to scale uh, at, a, at a scale and pace that will lead to, to, to the transformation that we need. We also need to, to support continuous innovation on the technologies. The technologies are changing um, with time, some of them with, uh, with IT, with uh, artificial intelligence and all this. If you look at the phone, the mobile phone, the phone that we had 20 years ago is completely different from the phone that we have to, to now uh, today. So we also need to continuously innovate on the technology itself so that we are able to respond to the needs and the changing needs of our communities. But also our, I mean, I think equally important is innovation around our engagement in society. Cooking is, a, is something that uh, talks to the behaviors of community, something that we decide on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we employ uh, different kinds of behavioral changes so that we are able to, 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 to unlock a huge market potential for innovators and entrepreneurs to be able, able to access these markets and grow their businesses. As you need to, we uh, support various programs that are focused on supporting innovation and entrepreneurship. It includes uh, clean cooking, we are running the Global Clean Technology Innovation Program, which is running in about 19 countries, where on one end, we support uh, innovators, homegrown innovators, to help them to transform their innovations into fast-growing, scalable, investable companies in, in, in these countries, but also to link them to early-stage financing. We also build and connect innovation and entrepreneurship or ecosystems, because the success of any innovator, any entrepreneur is not only around the, the technology that they have, but also talks to the ecosystems, the, the ecosystem that supports these, uh, these entrepreneurs and innovators. We'll soon be launching the Accelerate to Demonstrate facility, which is uh, a 65 million, um, million pounds uh, facility supported by the UK government. That's going to be supporting innovators and entrepreneurs um, to include uh, energy access, uh, that are in TRIL technology readiness level three to TRIL seven. We are going to support pilot projects, um, capacity building and other sources of support. I'm also quite excited that some of the companies that are going to present here, I think during I mean, the second the follow-up session, the following two sessions, 
We've benefited from the private finance advisory network where we work with innovators and entrepreneurs to help them to build their businesses and to access, uh, to introduce them to investors. So um, in short, we are quite excited with this uh, with this event. As you need, our focus is on building, uh, building and scaling ventures that are in the clean cooking space. And we look forward to continued partnership and um, a, a collaboration with all stake stakeholders on board. And also to mention that um, we are just uh, about to sign a collaboration with OPEC Fund or to, to collaborate in a program in Madagascar, which also involves sustainable energy for all, which is our clean cooking and reforestation program. So if we are to have uh, transformative solutions in clean cooking space, we also need to look at the various impacts of clean cooking, clean cooking from an emissions perspective, clean cooking from a climate uh, mitigation perspective, but also clean cooking from a climate adaptation perspective. We need to bring these multiple benefits of clean cooking so that it becomes a viable industry that uh, the private sector can engage in and make money in the process. Thank you, I wish you a successful event. Thank you, Alois. Um, now we are getting into the core uh, agenda of the um, webinar. Uh, I am uh, ready to hand over uh, the floor to our moderator of the panel one, Mr. Mikhail Melin. Uh, Mikhail is the head of people-centered programs at the Sustainable Energy for All and he is also leading its work on access to clean cooking. Mikhail is an international relations expert with ex extensive experience in sustainable development and energy transitions in line with the SDG 7 and the Paris Agreement on Climate. Prior to joining SE for All, Mikhail spent over a decade and uh, with the European Union delegation working in the field of economic and energy cooperation across several sub-Saharan African countries and also Eastern Caribbean countries. So Mikhail, floor is yours. Many thanks, Joseph, for that kind introduction. And thank you again to the organizers, Unido, Irene, and certainly the Council on Ethanol uh, Clean Cooking uh, that was launched at COP27. As we heard from the opening session, we all know what the challenge is, but what we want to do in this next session is really to turn that challenge into a 2.4 million people opportunity and an opportunity for action not only for governments, but private sector and partners to support. And I'm pleased to say um, that I have this role as moderator and I was quickly looking at the lineup of speakers where we have voices from the private sector, voices from partner organizations, but also importantly, voices from government. And I think that, uh, yes, quickly calculating, I'm sure that we have more than a hundred years of experience uh, and that you're gonna be enjoying uh, over the next 45 minutes or so. Moving on, I would like to start off this session uh, by inviting uh, Ms. Dina Bakovsky, who is the chair of the International Energy Agency's Bioenergy Technology Collaboration Program, and also the secretary of the Advanced Motor Fuels Technology Collaboration, a real expert, uh, leading experts on biofuels and bioenergy to open this session with the landscape presentation on the, on the status and the opportunity for action. With that, uh, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Mikael. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, let me check with you whether my presentation is visible and also in full screen mode. Yes, it is. Perfect, thank you. So it is really my pleasure to be here today at this important event uh, for knowledge sharing uh, on ethanol-based clean cooking and um, surrounding uh, issues. Um, I'm thankful for this invitation. I am currently chairing the IEA Bioenergy uh, TCP. Uh, but um, what I'm presenting today is based on earlier work um, that we did uh, last year um, a position paper on establishing an ethanol industry in developing countries. Um, and so that's what I'm going to just very briefly guide you through. Um, 
I'm starting off with this picture taken from the IEA's net zero by 2050 report. And I usually use it to show how much modern bioenergy has to grow in order to allow for decarbonization of the energy sector. Uh, but this time I would like to highlight the two blue, light blue boxes on the left hand side of the picture, which is the traditional use of biomass. So this is traditional use of biomass mainly for heating, uh, for cooking purposes, uh, leading to open indoor fires, um, health problems associated with this, also deforestation problems associated with this. Uh, I believe you know all of this very well. And according to the Sustainable Development Goals, all of this uh, traditional use of biomass should magically disappear by 2030. So from an IEA perspective, um, we're focusing on the modern bioenergy. But here, I think it is very important to focus on how to phase out this traditional use of biomass and turning to clean cooking solutions for sure is uh, a very, very important part of uh, enabling this transition. So I guess you will know this picture quite well showing um, what is the current access to clean cooking worldwide. And as Ute has already mentioned, in 2020, it was still 2.4 billion people globally lacking access to clean cooking. And we see that many of these are in Africa or Southeast Asia. So here it is a big environmental and health problem and uh, clean cooking solutions, and in particular, ethanol-based clean cooking can provide solutions here. If a country is to introduce ethanol production and consumption and build an industry here, uh, you can really have many, many benefits. So depending on what you use the ethanol for, if you use it for um, substituting transport fuel, uh, you could blend it into gasoline, then you will have greenhouse gas emission reductions and you will save on foreign exchange because you don't have to import so much fossil fuel. If you use it as a clean cooking fuel, it can alleviate um, the air pollution and avoid deforestation. But the very important thing here is you can also have benefits uh, for the people involved because um, cultivating the feedstock for ethanol production and then producing the ethanol and distributing it, this will create jobs and income along the value chain. And given the big size and scale of the problem and given the scale and pace that we need to find a solution for clean cooking, it is really essential to um, uh, build up an industry here and not just rely on very small uh, initiatives that cover a few villages here and a few there. So where can we take a best practice example from uh, for introduction of ethanol? Of course, this case of Brazil is a very shining example. It is done based on um, the introduction of ethanol as a transport fuel, but I think we can still see the many, many benefits that um, the um, the introduction of ethanol has had for the country. So Brazil is the second largest ethanol fuel producer and the second largest consumer in the world, has avoided some 53 million tons of CO2 through the uh, use of ethanol. Um, and in uh, the dependency on petroleum exports, sorry, is, oh, how do we get backwards? Dependency on petroleum imports is below zero because Brazil is a net exporter of ethanol. Um, the production of ethanol in Brazil is based on the sugarcane industry and um, clearly integrated very well with this industry. And here we have 2.3 million jobs. Um, there is, has been investments in sugarcane production around 10 billion US dollars, and it contributes to national GDP 2.4%. So you can see that there is many uh, benefits to the society in Brazil uh, from the introduction of the ethanol. Um, 
we tried to estimate what could be the macroeconomic benefits for other countries. And we took uh, the 20 countries pointed out um, by UNIDO as those most in need of uh, clean cooking solutions. And we found if you, well, again, looking at the transport sector uh, as the main market, if you want to introduce 10% of ethanol in the gasoline, you only need 2% of agricultural land to cover that. And you only need 1% of the GDP as an investment to do this, but it will save you up to 0.5% of GDP on fuel imports every year. So uh, of course, these are only ballpark figures. And uh, of course, the market size of ethanol for clean cooking can be larger or smaller than for introducing E10. But this is just a rough estimate to show you um, how little is needed and how much can be the benefit of introducing an ethanol uh, clean cooking solution in your country and an ethanol uh, industry. So I think that ethanol is an opportunity for you to provide clean cooking solutions, to create income and to improve your people's living conditions in many ways. And I'm very happy to be part of an initiative trying to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dina, for that brilliant presentation, which really is to the point and highlights the many benefits, including the substitution of fossil fuels, the supply of clean cooking fuels for uh, clean cooking fuels, but also the broader economic opportunities that are within reach. Before moving to the panel, there's uh, two things to the audience. Uh, if you have questions uh, to any of the speakers, please uh, look down on your screen and you have the question and answers box and you can post your questions in writing and we hope to then be able to pick them up from there. But before we also go to the panel, I also have the pleasure of uh, quickly um, asking uh, the support team to press play on a video which will showcase the bioethanol clean cooking project project in Tanzania by UNIDO and that will also provide a nice introduction to the, to the discussion that will follow. So with that, uh, Cutting trees for firewood and charcoal making is a major cause of environmental destruction in Tanzania. UNIDO, in collaboration with the Vice President's Office and other key stakeholders, under support from the Global Environment Facility, has developed the project for the promotion of biethanol as clean alternate fuel for cooking in Tanzania. The aim of the project is to provide clean cooking solution to half a million households in Dar es Salaam over a period of five years. This will enable households to shift from charcoal and other wood fuels into biethanol. This project already kicked off uh, following an initial uh, pilot that we did in Zanzibar. And we are glad to say that we are not doing it single-handed as you need, but in fact we are co collaborating with a private sector institution that won't bid, that is Consumer Choice Limited. The project uh, entails a distribution of uh, 110,000 stoves in 20 wards in, in Dar es Salaam. Yes, the project for clean cooking was introduced in Zanzibar for some time and uh, of course during the pilot stage and uh, my colleague in the Ministry of in the Industry, in the same Ministry of Trade and Industry and uh, Markets used, worked very well in this project. Uh, Tanzania Bill of Standard has been cascaded uh, the task of preparation of standard for two products in that project, namely the cooking ethanol standards and the uh, cooking ethanol cooking stoves standard. Mradi wa majiko ya spirit kwa kweli tuliupokea vizuri na ulitufurahisha sana. Tulipata mafunzo na mna gani ya kuyatumia haya majiko na tukaweza kuyafahamu na tukayafurahia vizuri sana. Sugar Industries producing molasses were involved in implementing the bioethanol project. If I come to ethanol production, we have started with 5,500 KLPD per day capacity and we uh, invested more into that and now we have a capacity of 8 KLPD so basically we can produce up to 8,000 uh, 
uh, liters uh, per day. Manake wenzangu naambiwa wanunue moto safi ni jiko zuri ambalo uzuri wake hata kama unaambiwa sasa hivi hapo unaitwa sehemu fulani nyumbani unaweza kuondoka nalo kaliweka kwenye begi kaenda nalo kwa sababu kwa mazingira ya nyumbani mikoa inakuwa mkali shida nani kuni ni shida kwa hiyo hii ukienda nalo inakuwa ni nafuu Thank you then checking in uh, if Emilia Nianda if you're on the line and if you can hear you assuming that you are and I see you there Emilia Nianda is the senior officer of renewable energy at the Ministry of Energy in Tanzania and a real clean cooking champion uh, for the country as well Emilia I mean in Tanzania you have quite a bit of experience in promoting bioethanol solutions for clean cooking including recently with the support from Unido uh, that the video that we just saw also spotlighted. Could you be sharing some of the key lessons that have emerged so far? And also, how does bioethanol fit into Tanzania's national clean cooking strategy moving forward? With that, uh, Emilia, over to you. Yes, Mick, how are you? Good, and I'm good to hear you again. Yes, long, long time. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, I am. Um, can you hear me? We hear you well, and we see you also. Yes, um, I work with the bench where our key responsibility is. Uh, and seeing the, the energy sector moving to where we wish to be. So the one of the key area and in terms of uh, promoting is the issue of cleaning uh, cooking. So the the reasons for doing this they are, they are obvious from the environment uh, access uh, to clean energy uh health issues so we are in to see the sector in this uh, area of clean cooking that moving to a level whereby uh, every uh, tanzania uh, is really uh, happy so what are we really doing uh, uh, this space we are undertaking some uh, program uh, we are really grateful to European Union, which operates. They are in implementing a, 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 a huge uh, project. It's called Integrated Approach to Clean, uh, clean Cooking Solution. Number of technologies and the fuels has been identified. And one of them uh, really promoting is the uh, uh, bioessence through the uh, which the, the, the film was created, we had a very good lesson and we saw no reason on why where the project supported by uh, European Union is trying to scale up the uh, um, uh, the previous uh, JFU project. So we allocated some funds and happy that you need all in the Jeff projects, they are also partners with us in the of this uh, project. So we last year, remember the government uh, initiated uh, a very uh, project in which now we are trying to come up with a strategy, strategy to toward trans transiting ourselves to the clean cooking solutions uh, and now establishing a national strategy which will be of course the uh, years to come we are targeting uh, 80 percent tanzanians uh, to be using clean cooking solutions so by Oceano is also one of the uh, candidates uh, under 
direction. So, of course, we are uh, considering other uh, approach, uh, green and uh, alternative. But in this aspect, we are really how the agriculture uh, sector, for instance, will contribute to the stock in the realization of my arsenal uh, cooking uh, solution. The, the two projects which UNIDO has been really resourceful, we are also looking on how we bring in other players and support to the already uh, existing national uh, related initiatives for, 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 for cooking. So really uh, in support of these uh, interventions and uh, because you know, is uh, a relative clean uh, source of energy for cooking and also with uh, obvious benefits, the job creations, realization support and support to uh, the uh, sector and the, 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 the environment. So that is what uh, at now. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Emilian. And we'll get back to you uh, shortly with some follow up questions. But before we do that, I wanted to turn the, the microphone to, to Nairobi and invite uh, Dr. Faith Bandera on Odongo, who's the Deputy Director of Renewable Energy at the Ministry of Energy and Petroleum in Kenya. And we also know, like Tanzania, that Kenya has put clean cooking as a top priority for the government and also the new president. And you have quite an ambitious target of providing clean cooking, universal access to clean cooking to all in Kenya by 2028. It would, could you, Dr. Faith, could you expand a bit on, on where you see bioethanol fit into the national clean cooking strategy? Uh, for you to meet the targets that you have set yourself? And also, what actions have you undertaken to overcome some of the challenges and hurdles on the way to that universal access by 2028 in Kenya? Dr. Faith, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, for giving me the opportunity to speak to the audience. Uh, ethanol is really a prime fuel for promoting clean cooking in Kenya, particularly because uh, we are currently developing a national clean cooking strategy. And this strategy embraces a wide range including bioethanol and including electricity. So ethanol is a uh, prime mainly because of uh, the experience we have had uh, of a private sector uh, coming into the market. Uh, the largest uh, player currently is uh, Coco Networks, uh, who is uh, distributed uh, ethanol to approximately 800,000 households. And uh, we have also found that through their system of distribution, uh, ethanol has become actually cheaper than kerosene, retailing at about 90 shillings a litre compared to kerosene, uh, which is uh, costing about 145 shillings per litre. So for us, this is a, a fresh injection into the uh, clean cooking uh, space. And uh, we have uh, tried to put together some projections, uh, estimating that uh, by 2028, we aspire to have 22% of uh, the clean cooking space comprising ethanol uh, fuel and technologies. And of course, this is uh, the, the largest uh, clean cooking fuel in the Kenyan market currently is uh, LPG. And simply because LPG has been uh, in our market for a much longer period, it's taking approximately 44% of the clean cooking market. Improved cook stoves take about 23.6%, while uh, biogas uh, will take uh, 3%. These are the projections that we have made for 2028. So the figures I'm giving you are for 2028. 
Uh, however, I would like to caution that uh, these figures are uh, not based on uh, hard data, except for the 22% that is uh, based on uh, data from uh, Coco Networks, who is the largest player in the market. The rest of the figures are estimates, but we are hoping that by October this year, we will have uh, more realistic figures based on uh, the baselines we are developing for the national clean cooking strategy. And I would also like to point out that ethanol has been tested and proven in Kenya to, in terms of uh, emission reduction, and the emission has been established to be much less than uh, the WHO threshold for household air pollution. And what we are seeing is that ethanol will replace firewood, charcoal, and kerosene. Not more of, uh, not, not LPG, uh, and not electricity because, uh, okay, electricity is also fast growing, but we are having a cautionary estimate of about 4% by 2028. So uh, uh, in terms of challenges, I think there are quite a number of challenges that are facing the Kenyan market. And first of all, we have the limited uh, development of the supply chain. Uh, so uh, to the extent that the, our local production is estimated at 1.2 million liters, while the demand is estimated at 8 million liters. This is according to the bioethanol master plan, which was uh, published in 2021. Then reaching rural areas is still a big challenge. And uh, this is similar experience to the electric grid where the development of uh, infrastructure for distributing uh, ethanol is still a challenge. And uh, I think as uh, evidenced by what Coco Networks is doing, they are first moving into the urban areas. So we still have a puzzle to decipher for the rural areas. And also informal settlements, I think that this is a target group that uh, needs, uh, whose needs need to, needs to be addressed. And yet currently we do not have a solution for that. There is also a limited flow of investments due to the unpredictable tax regime, which uh, we have been uh, grappling with for a long time. For example, we have 35% import duty on ethanol. We have 25% import tariffs on ethanol stores and canisters. The 16% VAT on fuel was exempted in 2021. And so was the uh, bioethanol VAT on stoves 2022, but uh, the situation is uh, really very unpredictable because this year the tax is exempted, then next year maybe you find they return the tax. So the current tax regime is very unpredictable for private investors to compete. Then we are also facing uh, competition from uh, foreign production. We have low capacities in the sugar factories. As you know, Kenyan production is mainly based on uh, molasses. And uh, we have not gone the juice, sugar cane juice way. So there's that low capacity that is still a bottleneck in terms of, uh, okay, right now we are grappling with the fact that how do we ramp up the local production using uh, feedstocks that are locally available? For example, sugar, sugar cane uh, juice and uh, cassava, these are prime uh, feedstock options for, for the local industry, beetroot has also been floated, but uh, its feasibility, I don't think, has been proven. Then uh, we have the uh, inefficient production processes. And we also face the food fuel uh, debate, though uh, we don't have a lot of data to support this uh, argument that uh, if we take uh, maybe sugarcane, we will uh, run out of sugar or uh, cassava, we will run out of food for people. I think nobody has gone uh, that length to prove this uh, fuel food debate. Then, okay, regarding the addressing the challenges, what we are doing is uh, we have been uh, discussing with uh, the private sector entities to uh, come up with a, an operating facility, special operating facility framework to support private sector investment uh, in uh, the ethanol industry. 
this has not yet been realized, but uh, this is something already under discussion. And uh, we have a TOR that has been uh, floated around with support from GIZ. So the other thing we are doing is uh, making interventions on uh, the green fiscal incentives framework. This was uh, the draft framework was floated around, uh, I think, uh, February, March this year. And we got the opportunity as the cooking subsector to input recommendations that should be considered to ramp up the clean cooking sector, particularly in the face of the targets that have been uh, set to attain uh, universal clean cooking by 2028. What we have proposed is uh, we would like to have a more predictable tax regime that uh, facilitates green tax breaks on cooking solutions and incentives, reflecting and uh, envisaging the pathways, transition pathways that we are recommending for the cooking sector. We have also proposed opportunities to access carbon financing based on Article 62 of the Paris Agreement for example, to promote uh, private sector participation within the ethanol value chain. We have also recommended uh, having a responsible carbon markets and also regulation in view of the fact that voluntary carbon markets have been a nuisance in our country in terms of uh, dumping improved cook stoves and uh, presenting them at uh, low prices. We have also requested to promote uh, a just and transparent carbon credits accounting framework. And we are also pro promoting, uh, su suggesting a pr the promotion of local production of clean cooking solutions. For example, biofuels and e-cooking have been specifically singled out in that policy proposal for the green fiscal incentives policy. I would like to stop there, Michael, thank you. No, thank you very much, Faith. And it's very interesting to hear about the many actions that are already underway. Maybe I'll change the order a bit. And um, Sophie, uh, boy, I turn to you. I mean, you're the head of public affairs at Coco Networks, a big player in the private sector, based in Nairobi, promoting ethanol fuels, fuel to household consumers, and have a quite an innovative business model altogether and very impressive results as well. How does uh, what Dr. Faith now uh, presented here, I mean, what additional recommendations would you like to give to the government from a private sector angle to be able to even scale further and faster and into new markets altogether? Uh, Sophie, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I'd like to recognize what Dr. Faith has said. It just shows how closely private sector and government work. Um, we, we have close collaboration and they're always um, engaging us. Um, I think just, just to bring everyone up to speed, Coco Networks, uh, we are a climate tech company. We use carbon financing to develop a fuel utility um, using bioethanol as the fuel of choice. And we retail at two Banakuka, and we've been doing this successfully since 2019. Uh, and as, as of now, we are at uh, slightly under 870,000 households across um, six urban areas. We launched into our sixth urban area over the weekend. Um, and we anticipate to be launching in Rwanda in quarter three. So we are expanding outside um, of Kenya. Um, our business model is innovative. As I said, we use carbon financing. And what we've done is we have made our solution affordable by removing about 60 US cents in the value chain. And this is through the use of uh, cocoa points or fuel ATMs that enable our consumers to easily refuel um, within, um, within walking distance of where they live. Uh, so we've, we've essentially provided the solution very close to them. Um, a slight correction also on what Faith said, effective this year, our fuel is retailing at uh, 78 shillings a liter, uh, which again is increasing the affordability to, to our consumers. Our focus is 100% um, on the consumer. Um, Faith has spoken a lot about our asks to government. Uh, we have been engaging government since 2016. And our ambition is to eventually sign an investment agreement because with an investment agreement, you have the predictability uh, that guarantees you can invest for a certain time period. Uh, we always seek 10 years, which is the similar period that Rwanda has given us. Um, and the commitment we, we make to government is not only will we 
um, invest a certain amount of money to build a network that covers both urban and rural communities, but we will also um, to give provide offtake agreements to producers of bioethanol. Um, as has been articulated, there's the challenge of ethanol production. And what we have seen um, within the recent years is there has been a lot of interest from ethanol producers. Um, just within the last one week, we have hosted two potential ethanol producers, one um, seeking to produce ethanol from cassava and another one from, uh, from Babu. And all of them are talking about engaging thousands of small scale farmers to produce the feedstock for them to be able to produce the bioethanol. So already you're seeing by virtue of proving this solution to be scalable, we are attracting investors. Um, and I know Dr. Linda is on the call as well. Um, through Giraffe, uh, we have also expressed, um, uh, they've reached out to us to sign an optic agreement. Uh, so we have proven that through demand creation, you can actually provide an environment for potential ethanol investors to come into the country. Uh, so in terms of getting back to government over and above the investment agreement is also to see how can you provide that similar environment for ethanol producers. Um, they are looking at different feedstock across different parts of the country. How can we provide a one-stop shop where all these potential investors can come, engage with Dr. Faith from Ministry of Energy, engage with someone else from uh, Treasury or the Ministry of Finance, and be able to understand what is required from them, be able to provide it, and then be, be facilitated um, to come and set up um, uh, the set up the factory and also um, have the start the conversations with uh, the farmers. Um, so I would say. It is, it is very important for any government to make it easy for an investor to handhold the investor and to uh, reduce the time taken from when an investor expresses interest until they are provided with an instruments they need to be able to bring to life what their vision is. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mikhail. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for that, um, those clear recommendations. I'm trying to keep an eye on the question and answers. And, and there was one question uh, from one of the participants, um, Sophie asking uh, how can you help build capacity of young women and young men to gain the skills to become entrepreneurs and get engaged in the in this sector do you have anything that you've spearheaded at coco uh, that speaks to the involvement of women young women and men in this space um i will start off with who who the the shopkeepers who we call our agents, they're the people who, dis, who where we install the cocoa points for dispensing our fuel. Our business model uh, uses works with pre-existing shopkeepers rather than um, installing our own shops. Uh, so we approach shopkeepers who have a high footfall and we have realized um, out of the 2,100 cocoa points that we have installed, majority of the agents that we work with over 70% are female owned. And what we do is we bring them on board. We do, we do educate them on business, um, how to manage business, but also we do educate them on how to manage our business, specifically in terms of recruiting customers and making sure that they can address any concerns around bioethanol. So in terms of downstream, we have made sure that uh, people who already have an existing business, we provide them an additional business. Uh, and we're able to have majority of them are then able to earn additional income. Um, as we've said upstream, we are not directly involved, but through our conversations with the various investors and the fact that they want to engage different farmers uh, and different, um, uh, different people across that value chain, uh, we are willing uh, to work closely with them and see how we can facilitate them to guarantee that offtake. Uh, and that, that sort of um, an expression of interest or a letter of support or that offtake agreement would be a guarantee for them to then go and do the capacity building for farmers or for whoever else they need to be able to produce the ethanol that we so um, we need, uh, whether it is now or going into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you many thanks, Sophie. Uh, turning to Frida, I mean, another um, private sector operator in the ethanol sector, in Tanzania in particular, uh, Frida, following the presentation and the opening words from Emilia Nianda, I mean, how, what would your recommendations be to the government in Tanzania and how should ethanol 
be part of the clean cooking strategy and the targets for the government? What would be your recommendations? Trina, over to you. Checking if Frida can hear us. It looks like we might have lost Frida there for a, for a second. So turning to Dr. Fate, if I may uh, turn to you, meanwhile, while we wait for Frida to reestablish the connection. There was a question also on this fuel and food debate, and you referenced that you had no proof that those would be in conflict. Could you say a few more words about that? Uh, because there was a few questions about it in the chat box. And also there was another question which related to are there some, uh, you know, uh, how safe and sound and environmental friendly is the ethanol production altogether, if you, if you had any insights on that, Dr. Page. Well, from my experience, I don't, I, I haven't come across a study in Kenya telling us that uh, if we do sugar cane for ethanol, especially when we do the juice, uh, we will be denying people sugar in Kenya. Hmm? Brazil has uh, largely depended on uh, sugar cane juice as the primary feedstock for ethanol production. Uh, Yeah, Faith, uh, we lost the audio from you. Can Faith, can you hear us? Oh. Yeah, some bandwidth issues there, but some bandwidth issues there, but um, so, and I see Frida is back now. Frida, welcome back. Yeah, I wanted to ask you just, I mean, uh, from a private sector operator's perspective in, uh, in Tanzania, what would you uh, want to convey to the government now that they're really prioritizing clean cooking again? And how do you see that ethanol should be a part of that clean cooking mix moving forward in Tanzania? What is the, what is the immediate opportunity that you see for action? Please, uh, I think you have to unmute your microphone. All right. Uh, Consumer Choice Tanzania is working already with the government and the UNIDO in um, promoting clean cooking in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, we have um, uh, we have a assembling plant and bottling uh, plant in our premises, whereby we we assemble these stoves and we bottle fuel from half a liter, one liter, and five liter for easy transportation and storage to to the final consumer. So the government can effectively incentivize uh, private sector entities like uh, Consumer Choice Tanzania to support government by, uh, they can provide um, financial incentives or this is like uh, all these products we're buying with the tax on it. So if they can um, give a tax break, especially to the uh, fuel uh, for this targeted market uh, for clean cooking, if they can, do a tax break or they can give another incentive like uh, and that would be easy and uh, affordable to every person who is going to use it. Um, also in the policies, uh, setting clear policies and regulations. Uh, most of these uh, policies, they have to be very clear, maybe in the local uh, language for in the regulation so that everyone who is using it knows uh, this is the policy, this is the regulation. And also promoting uh, partnership and collaboration, uh, providing uh, partnership and collaboration. Government has been, uh, with the private sector. They can now, uh, like now right now, we the government of Tanzania, UNIDO, EU, GEF. We're working together to promote this priority. But uh, if they want this product to go further and faster, they can even engage more private sector entities. Uh, to participate on this. And uh, we have providing technical assistance and capacity building. Um, recently, we've been uh, with an MOU with uh, TIRDO. This is Tanzania Industrial Research Development Organization, whereby uh, they do a research if they can um, 
produce this ethanol uh, from cashew apple fruits. So they can uh, put on a, a small micro distillery company and um, this can be a teaching um, micro distillery for any other small scale uh, person who wants to join this with a, any other feedstock. So we can have this product as much as possible in everywhere and uh, the, the price can be affordable to every person instead of using charcoal. And, um, and the final thing is raising awareness. You know, this technology is new to every person in, in the country. I've been, to the, I've been on the ground for the past, two, past three years. Um, awareness is very expensive I, I kind of, for private sector. So we urge the government to participate um, in the awareness, um, like they can put this in the radio, the TV, everywhere. Like even they can go further and put this to their um, primary education curricula for our children to start learning it from a younger age and they grow to know that uh, uh, clean cooking is the way to go and the future. Um, this is my point and I'll stop here. Thanks, thanks very much for, you, Dad, uh, for those recommendations and I'm sure um, Emilian heard them well. Emilian, I mean, uh, certainly awareness is a very important element, often overlooked. Uh, and what, Emilian, if you hear me, um, uh, what do you see uh, that the government could do to raise awareness around clean cooking fuel, such as ethanol, to, to really accelerate that adoption at household levels, but also at institutional level and perhaps in schools too? So, uh, Emilian, do you have some plans underway from the government on that end? Yeah, thank you, Mick, and uh, thanks to Frida for uh, identifying the challenge and the call for collaboration of the government, the, the government in the private sector. So, on the national strategy on clean cooking, we are uh, we realize the challenge that of the uh, in adequate awareness to the uh, uh, masses. So what we are doing, we are uh, through the national strategy, we are coming up with the uh, awareness, awareness uh, strategy. So a number of interventions will be identified. And in doing this, we are uh, involving all the stakeholders, including people like Frida, the, the, the pri private se uh, sector. So we understand there have been some initiatives here and there, but only uh, awareness, promotion, but they were really not so coordinated and well involved. So some of the recommendation, I think, coming from the private sector will be uh, considered the issue of uh, curriculum. Of course, we are aware right now through maybe in primary and secondary school through science, there are some uh, the initiative to integrate the issues of uh, renewable energy covering a range of uh, uh, several technologies up to the clean cooking. So for us, we are really uh, looking at the awareness as, as one of the serious intervention if we really want to promote a uh, clean cooking. And uh, as I said, one of the area we are looking up is to come up with the national awareness uh, strategy, which is really uh, involved. So maybe me, let, let me take this advantage again on uh, uh, responding to some of the issues laid by uh, Fred. I'll just take one minute. With regard to uh, maybe the support, so we are, of course, uh, through our policies, we the, the strategies now will come up with the mechanism on how do we really uh, probably uh, provide uh, appropriate incentives see, in, uh, to our developers. But again, uh, the issue of taxi, of course, it's one of the consideration, but we are also encouraging the local uh, manufacturing uh, within the, the country so that some of this uh, cost can be reduced through that intervention. And we are calling upon our uh, R&D research and the development institutions to come up with innovative solutions, which will, will, will reduce the reliance on the important 
uh, fuel and appliances for promotion of uh, uh, bioethan. So on the yeah, the issue of collaboration also that is the way to go. And she testified that in most of this uh, uh, project, the, the GF, even the one we are doing that, mm -hmm. there was really high collaboration with the, 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 the government in trying to bring in these projects and making sure we are partnering with the private sector. And that is the commitment of the government that if we want to really uh, uh, move our agenda, we have to uh, widen up the scope of collaboration. Thank, thank you, Mick. Thank you, thank you very much Nanda, uh, for that. I think we're at some risk of upsetting the organizers if I don't bring this to a close. So I think that what I'll do is that I'll invite the speakers to perhaps have a look at the questions and answers uh, there and uh, type your answers to the questions that are there. And um, with that, I really a big thank you to all the, to the speakers of this uh, session now and also to the audience uh, for staying and listening in to this very interesting discussion. I mean, what's clear is that there's a lot of activities and actions on the way from both government, there's private sector stepping in. I mean, there's innovation, there's job opportunities, there's youth opportunities, a range of opportunities. So we're really looking forward to working closely closely on this agenda moving forward and certainly also perhaps sending some of these key recommendations to focus on to the council on ethanol uh, clean cooking so that they, they can develop their work program based on some of the recommendations coming out from this discussion. With that, uh, again, a big thank you and uh, over to you, Josie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mikhail, uh, for this uh, excellent uh, moderation. And uh, thank you, all the panelists. Um, now, uh, keeping um, time in our uh, you know, main concern, uh, I am uh, happy to invite our second moderator, uh, Ms. Ute Collier. She is already very familiar to you all. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of the Knowledge Policy and Finance Center at the International Renewable Energy Agency in Abu Dhabi. She is also responsible for policies for scaling up end use um, uh, decarbonization, green hydrogen, sustainable bioenergy, renewables in uh, power sector, as well as energy access. She is also co leads uh, IRENA's annual flagship publication, The World Energy Transition. Outlook. Uh, pr um, prior to joining Arena uh, in, in May 2021, she was head of energy at uh, Practical Action, leading the or development organization's work on renewable energy solutions in energy access settings. Uh, she has also worked in the international Energy Agency and uh, UK Climate Change Committee. Ute, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Josie, for the introduction. So our second session will focus on building sustainable supply chains, but we will also discuss a little bit what happens if you don't build sustainable supply chains and, and what some of the challenges would, will be for companies and how to strengthen local enterprises. Now, I know we touched on some of these topics in the first session, but we're going to bring in some more um, experiences from different countries. So yes, we have Kenya again, because Kenya is, is leading in, in so many areas these days on, on clean cooking. But we will also hear um, some experiences from Nigeria, from Mozambique and from Ghana. And then we will hear uh, the sort of funders' perspective. So we've got uh, five panelists. We've got 45 minutes left. <laughs> so, um, but we want to make sure we still have a little bit of time at the end for 
our audience to ask questions. If there are relevant questions there already, which we haven't covered, we will we'll try and pick them up. But also, please, as you listen, do continue to uh, put some questions into the Q&A box. We will either try and take them uh, for, for the panelists to respond, but also the panelists, of course, uh, are welcome to answer things directly in the Q&A. Okay, let's start with uh, an experience from Nigeria. Femi Oye is the founder of Green Energy Biofuels. So you have, your company has used water hyacinths, which I know are a big problem in, in many places, and waste sawdust as the main source of feedstock for producing ethanol for clean cooking fuels. What have been some of your, the, the key challenges you've encountered and the lessons uh, for building sustainable supply chains, which you can share with us? Thanks, Femi, over to you. Yeah, um, good day, everyone. And thank you for, for joining the session and thank you for having me. Um, uh, our experience um, in Nigeria could as well be similar to what we've seen from other, other country, especially when you look at the uh, nascent stage by which Balfour development has been um, from onset. Uh, when we started in 2011, 2011, uh, we have to uh, critically look at the, um, the policy that is in place, the regulatory framework that is in place, um, the kind of investment that we're able to secure locally, and also the types that we could uh, attract. And um, based on our study, so we have to go for um, a vertically integrated business model. So this also has its own ups and downs in terms of challenges because you have to look after uh, downstreams and uh, upstream sides of managing the business. And uh, the lacuna that you now have here is uh, Nigeria has um, witnessed a very prolonged um, foreign exchange and currency instability where your investors have to continue to battle with different rates at the, at the central bank. So you have more than four different rates when you need to like grapple with um, in and outflow of, uh, of funding. So it's been pretty much challenging to even get a predictable or a long-term plan based on such because you fix a price for your products today then in a couple of weeks or days then the price jump and um, ethanol production in nigeria unlike we have in some other african countries 98 percent are foreign source so it, that means it depends on import 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 so you have to rely on foreign exchange to be able to um, secure ethanol usage in in the country and out of the 98 percent less than 0.5 percent could actually be used for any other source likely is being used for the, by the pharmaceuticals and also the um the companies that produces drinks and also paint industries so there's like likely no company that really focuses ethanol or targets ethanol towards a cooking and that presented a good opportunity for green energy biofuel at the time we we started and being also a an environmentally conscious company we have to look at the entire fish stock that we have to go with um our greek value chain wasn't doing very well also with its own challenge in terms of uh, supply chain access to a uh, smallholders farmer aggregation, logistic problem in terms of transportation, the cost input that also has to go into all of these. And um, we now have to go for um, second generation uh, biofuel production. So that's what brought about our water high sense and then sawdust. So these are largely agricultural waste. So we, we started with about 5,000 liter capacity uh, plant 
that uh, back then in about 2014, 2015, when we started our um, cellulosic production. At the same time, you still need to depend on a lot of input. The chemicals and the reagents that you need to use to complete this also poses the other challenge where you also need to rely on a foreign, foreign exchange. So foreign exchange policy, these are some of those challenges that uh, companies like us continue to face. And uh, in the center of this as well, we also have a subsidy regime that has been placed on the alternative. So if you have to encourage families to move away from using kerosene or other dirty fuel, but these product, alternative products are heavily subsidized by the government. So it makes local production not to be attractive because you have to produce at a competitive rate compared to what is being used. So apart from government policy uh, subsidy, we also have uh, the bedevil part of uh, the supply chain in terms of high cost of transportation, access to even some of the waterways, logistic to move your feedstock to plant, and also getting the right uh, materials for, for, for treatment. So these are some of the uh, challenges that uh, companies like us has to face over, over the years and would continue to face that notwithstanding. And the other part of it is our market side where we use our green ambassadors. And that has been very, very helpful because the cost saving over that, if we have to do the distribution, like cocoa does in East, in East Africa. So we have this huge network of green ambassadors that champion the marketing, the distribution, and helping to reach a customer site. So uh, the weight of logistic in terms of value chain around that has been taken care of by our entrepreneurs. So we train them, we empower them, and they invest, they co-invest in the business with us. And that has likely helped the business to grow. Today, we, we have over a million cook stoves that we have in Nigeria and other part of West African countries like the Gambia and Ghana, Benin Republic, where we currently have our uh, network uh, operational. So maybe I will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in fact, you, you raised the issue of currency instability. And interesting enough, I hadn't myself thought about the fact, of course, that even if you go to a sustainable, well, a local feedstock, you still have the issues around, say, needing to import chemicals. So it's quite problematic. Thelma, I know currency instability is an issue you wanted to raise. So, so Thelma Venichand is going to talk to us about Mozambique. She's the founder of Zoe Enterprises. Well, it's I understand that one of your biggest challenges has been that you you have depended on imported ethanol, and then Mozambique, of course, went through a long economic uh, recession. Can you please tell us how the drastic change in exchange rates has affected the sales of ethanol fuel and, and what kind of implications that had for your business and any recommendations you have? Thank you. Thelma, are you still muted? Can we can we unmute Thelma from our end, please? Is that possible? So let me just check. Yeah. Right. Uh, Go. Check. check. Okay. Fine. Uh, I'll, I'll, I would like to read because I am improving from a stroke, mm -hmm. so I have difficulties in expressing myself. So I want to share to the audience, the experience of Mozambique and the major challenge we passed, uh, had experienced. Mozambique went through an economic re recession 
from 2014 for a long time. The, the, the exchange average exchange rate from the gold dollar to Metikaiz, Metikaiz is the currency we use, start, went from in 2000, 2015 for 39, in 2016 went up to 63. Can you imagine? That's above a double. In 2017, we had a dollar at almost 71 dollars. So you can imagine how it affected the the uh, production and uh, in so the it, in the, during these three years the cost of ethanol based fuel went up significantly the price of the ethanol fuel to the clients also increased drastically the low low income families uh, had their their basic food gone up in all areas sugar bread cornmeal so as a consequence uh, uh, the fuel became to also uh, became expensive, expensive. Mm -hmm. so M mozambique produces ethanol at small volumes and high pr prices zoe imported the ethanol from south africa so I don't know whether we have a connection problem suddenly, because uh, Thelma appears frozen and I think we've lost patience as well. Thelma, can you hear us? Okay, I think there is a problem. Linda, are you there though, are you? I can still see it, see you. Uh, I I'm right here. I'm right here. It's here. Right, but right. So maybe we'll we'll talk to you first, and then if Thelma uh, is back and patients, hopefully we we'll, we'll, can come back to them. There's always a problem with these uh, things. So Linda, we've already heard a little bit about giraffe because um, Sophie mentioned you. So you've been working on developing local ethanol value chains from cassava and focusing then on addressing uh, fuel needs for clean cooking in urban areas. Could you please share your perspectives and lessons on sustainably uh, scaling up bioethanol for using clean cooking, especially also thinking a bit about the co-benefits, not just for households, but also farmers? Thank you. No, fantastic. Thank you for this opportunity. And it's wonderful to have um, supporters and colleagues from Kenya I specifically want to acknowledge Dr. Faith and my colleague also from Cocoa Networks, Sophie. And the reason why it's important for me to acknowledge um, this ecosystem player is because they make the work of giraffe bio energy uh, not easy, but uh, certainly, you know, we work collaboratively in, uh, in, uh, collaboratively to, to deliver the, um, the work of domestic ethanol production. And what I mean by that is, let me explain a little bit about what we do at Giraffe by Energy very, very quickly. The first is we have an agricultural model where we produce cassava at large scale, and we are our own off-takers of this cassava into a biorefinery, a state-of-the-art biorefinery, producing ethanol cooking fuel at its main product. Um, and we feel quite um, lucky, I guess, to be able to have a concentrated and 
successful off-taker potential in cocoa networks and other distributors in Kenya as well. So it makes our work quote unquote easy because we don't have to think about the last mile distribution. So we uh, very much um, applaud and cheer the success of Cocoa Networks and her, and her counterparts in that space because we're able to make the financial case that if we produce ethanol domestically, then you know it's an income substitution place. A lot of the colleagues here have talked about forex externalizations and the challenges with that. I've had discussions around supply chain, um, with uh, bringing in chemicals and other products coming into the country to serve the, the sector. So we are really concentrating on growing the domestic market. So back to where I started, we've got an agricultural program and then we've got the biorefinery program and then we don't have to necessarily uh, worry too much about the distribution um, side of production. So. If I can just share some of our experiences on the agricultural side, indeed, um, as a person whose uh, experience was mainly in the biorefinery in terms of production, the vertical integration that my colleague from Nigeria explained is one piece that is, uh, is, is particularly challenging and I'll explain why. So in other jurisdictions, Nigeria, Thailand, Brazil, that we talk about, you usually have the feedstock in abundance. So a biorefinery and ethanol distiller is additional, right? Because people are looking for outlets for these particular feedstocks. But the case in Kenya is as a biofuel producer, I cannot just play in that middle section. I have to go upstream and develop that agriculture. And when you're in agriculture, then you're exposed to those risks as well, number one. So the risks include the climate change risks because you're now developing a large scale agricultural product where it did not exist before. So as a biofuel producer, I find myself suddenly as a farmer, right? So I've got the climate change risk that comes into that. Suddenly my capex is increased. Whereas again, in Thailand or India or in other areas where starchy substrates or biofuel substrates are readily available, now I have to have a capex around developing a smallholder farmer and nucleus um, agricultural program, right? So when I'm going to approach um, investors for funding, you know, there is that much of a doubling or a tripling of the capex that you need to put together the program, right? So that's a challenge that I personally had not fully appreciated coming into uh, producing biofuel in Kenya as a process engineer or, uh, or an industrial microbiologist. So again, it just bears quote unquote repeating that the challenges that my colleagues have explained are indeed spot on, right? So we absolutely need a robust biofuel policy. And here's where again, I acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues from the Ministry of Energy. In Kenya, we've tried to have that cohesive um, approach in some of the strategies that are being developed, uh, but certainly as an ethanol producer, we have the Kenya Ethanol Cooking Master Plan that was put out in 2021, 2022. And this uh, creates a roadmap, right? A base case, a worst case, and um, the high case scenario that actually provides producers like me a good um, idea, a good roadmap of what the pathway would look like to 2028, where we've declared we want Kenya to be um, universal clean cooking. So we're grateful for a cohesive, um, uh, uh, for, for, a, for a policy environment for the producers. But at the same time, and not contradictory, it is understandable that the policy environment for distributors has to be streamlined as well. So you've got that tension around, let's make it easy to stimulate domestic production, however, without the market, right? And the market being proven initially by imported ethanol, right? And then once our domestic production reaches maturity, then the kind of protective tariffs, you know, can then go away, right? If that makes sense. 
So together, my colleagues from Ministry of Energy and the distributor here, right, in Kenya, just working towards a co um, cohesive policy environment is definitely one of the things that we need to do. Secondly, is really encouraging incentives around the agricultural space, right? And whatever those might look like, uh, you know, fertilizer subsidies is one of the things that people think about immediately, but there's a lot more um, uh, around, there's a lot more policy um, thinking that can happen around stimulating the agricultural side, especially for biofuel production, especially for ethanol cooking fuel. So let me leave it at, uh, at those two key points and uh, I'm sure I'll have another chance to explain the others. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, but clearly there is quite a few pieces to the puzzle or we need to somehow fall into place. Okay, so it doesn't look as if we've got Thelma back yet. Um, so we'll continue with Patience then. Patience is co-founder of Econexus Ventures in Ghana. So based on your experience in Ghana, what are some of the key fa factors you've encountered that influence the sustainability and accessibility of ethanol fuels for clean cooking? And what are your perspective on, um, you know, what governments can, governments and other development institutions can do to support the development of local en enterprises, and as well, you know, ensure that uh, the incentives there for farmers and consumers. Please go ahead. Sorry, we can't quite hear you, patients. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, it's slightly better. Okay, great. So um, I'm Patience and co-founder of Econexus, and we are into the production of bioethanol clean cooking fuel from pineapple waste and cashew apples. Uh, please, I just want to be sure if you can hear me clearly. Yes, it's fine. Thank you. All right, sure. Um, so, I mean, we started um, this uh, in 2019, and it is surprising that Equinexus is the first company in Ghana producing bioethanol fuel. And um, this brought to the fact that some of the factors that is affecting the sustainability and accessibility of clean cook cooking fuel and stove is number one, consumer behavior and adoption. Many people in Ghana here do not, I mean, know much about ethanol fuel. Since we are the first company, we are doing our best to promote uh, our fuel into various communities. Currently, we, have, we are into only three regions in Ghana, and we have 16 regions in Ghana. That means that there's going to be more education and awareness. So uh, this is a major factor. Many of the um, people or many households are brought down to the traditional method of using um, firewood, charcoal for cooking. And most of them, based on their cultural belief and superstition belief, they don't really appreciate the eternal fuel. So that boils down to we promoting or creating awareness of the benefits of bioethanol fuel that will benefit their health and also promote economical skill as well. Another major factor is economic factor. So um, many uh, people in the rural community, they don't have much income and that affects their purchasing power of our bioethanol fuel. We have made our fuel very affordable, but even that many uh, women or many individuals or households in rural community do not have uh, the, the purchasing power to buy our um, clean cooking stove and bioethanol fuel. Currently, we are procuring the clean cooking stove. So that means that we are buying it in dollars. So when we buy it in dollars, that means that the price cannot, I mean, we cannot reduce it to the way that we will run a loss. So we try our best and give it a, a reasonable price. And even with that, many of the families or communities in rural um, communities in Ghana do not have the purchasing power to buy that. So in, with this aspect, um, we assessing carbon credits financing can help us distribute the store for free. So this is when the government or uh, agencies can come in to support what we are doing here in Ghana. Another factor is social demographic factor. In Ghana here, most of the women have the power in the kitchen. 
but it will surprise you that they don't have the power to influ influence authorities in the household. Most of the men are the head of the home. So they give the final say that, okay, we are going to use firewood, we are going to use gas, we are going to use this. So if, I mean, government leaders or members of parliament are able to help us create um, national strategies in terms of creating awareness, we'll be able to, I mean, help um, various households, uh, such as um, various communities, various um, households to have awareness of whatever we are doing so that the men can also accept the adoption of clean cooking uh, fuel and stove. Another factor that influence, I mean, the accessibility and sustainability of clean cooking is household composition. Many of the households that have large number, like maybe their family of 10 or 15, they want to use a fuel that they can easily have access to or, or purchase because uh, on, on a daily basis, they cook a I mean, meal on a last kill. So they want to have a fuel that can easily help them to have access to their meal. So they are not even looking at alternatives such as bioethanol fuel. They want to go with the wood fuel that, can, that they could easily access. So this border on how we, uh, government leaders or international agencies can support small enterprises like us to create outlets in various communities so that this free world could be easily accessible to families, even families with large size and families with small size so that they can also have access to I mean, clean cooking fuel. We're, we're talking about bioethanol fuel is very important, especially in, in, in our era now due to, I mean, the Russian Ukraine war, we all know how prices of gas have shoot rapidly. And uh, World Health Organization have made us understand that not less than 2.5 million households are affected by household in, uh, in air pollution. That means that in Ghana here, um, the statistics of household in air pollution is very high. And this is why, why whatever we are doing here is very important. Our product, that is our bioethanol fuel and clean cooking stove is important. Now, how can government support small enterprises like us? They can do that by helping us create awareness through education. So they can help us um, by going to various communities to educate um, various households, uh, on the importance of using bioethanol fuels. They can, the members of parliament can create their best where they can invite more of the women in various communities where we can get a platform and educate them on the essence of, of uh, using bioethanol fuels, switching from the traditional method to bioethanol fuel. And now um, governments can also support farmers uh, with fertilizers to grow crops that can help us produce more of the bioethanol fuel. In Ghana here, we use the pineapple waste, sugarcane molasses, and cashew apples. That means that if government is able to empower farmers that produce these crops on a large scale, that means that, uh, I mean, we can have access to the bio waste and also, I mean, meet the demand in the market. It will surprise you that currently we have access to 512 households in Ghana here. And even with them, they are very excited on the usage of our bioethanol fuel. And they are telling their uh, other friends, other families to adopt our fuel. That means that the demand is growing. And due to this, um, we really need the government to support us. Another major factor is that um, normally with the funds that we get from international donors and agencies are mostly based on um, production equipment. And they forget that, uh, I mean, other aspects of the eternal business is important, such as marketing, business development, research and uh, business, um, and research development, and also logistics and, and transportation and creating new outlets. Most of these funds that we receive are bought down to the production equipment, and it limits us a lot. We need to, I mean, get employed staff to produce our bioethanol fuel and stuff. So if, I mean, the funds are not limited to only production equipment, but also targeted towards other aspects of the ethanol business, that will help us to increase our production capacity and also make our product accessible to various communities in Ghana here. And this year, we are looking at expanding to seven other regions in Ghana. We currently have a contract with Siemens to produce, I mean, industrial stoves.
for four senior high schools in Ghana. And that is very exciting because we are looking at the industrial market now. It is surprising that in Ghana here, most of the senior high schools are using wood floor. And most of the senior high school, they have over 5,000 students. So that's how you, <laughs> on a daily basis, the wood floor they consume. So if uh, they come and adopt our um, technology, that is our industrial clean cooking stove and bioethanol floor. It should just surprise you the amount of carbon we can emit and the amount of lives we can improve. So these are some of the sectors that the government can support us as well. Thank you, Patience. And in fact, uh, one of the points you made about the funding also from development institutions, um, you know, the fact that it shouldn't just be about the technology, there are lots of different aspects. Maybe this is something Lunis can uh, pick up uh, in your answer. So, so you work for the OPEC Fund for International Development and the, the fund is scaling uh, funding for national clean cooking programs, examples being for um, the Madagascar National Clean Cooking Transition Program which is about ethanol cook stoves. So from your experience, what steps do, do you think both governments and the private sector in those countries need to take to enable funders such as yourself to deploy much larger amounts of capital to support these programs? And maybe also respond to uh, patients' point if you can. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and thank you for this invitation. Um, as you rightly mentioned, uh, we uh, recently approved a large financing uh, to the government of Madagascar for uh, their national uh, transition, clean cooking transition program. Um, that being said, and that might be the answer to your question, um, the, the, the entirety of the loan amount is not going to be targeted exclusively at clean cooking solution. Um, our approach is to be a bit more holistic in the way that we address this issue. And uh, within the program, we've made sure to include a component, a large component actually on reforestation and also on community empowerment, especially women empowerment. Because what we want to showcase is that uh, if handled properly, a clean cooking operation can have immense impact on a wide array of SDGs. Uh, of course, the most obvious are health and uh, environment protection, but um, when we provide clean cooking solutions, in addition to preserving the environment and the health of the, of the households, we also provide an opportunity for women to uh, get a lot of uh, independence uh, because uh, traditional cooking takes a lot of time. It's inefficient. Whereas if you're using uh, modern cooking solutions, uh, uh, what used to take hours, and let alone when you actually have to fetch wood, when you're not even using charcoal, but, but uh, firewood. So all this time can be saved. And the idea is to capitalize on this time savings so that we can also provide some, let's say, education, training, and economic opportunities um, for uh, these women and these families especially if they are geared towards uh, environment protection because um, sustainable uh, businesses um, are going to be more and more um, uh, profitable, especially when you can uh, monetize carbon credits. Um, so what we're looking to do is to really try to have, um, to look at the bigger picture. We feel that a lot of the initiatives have, have not been re really uh, wor working too well because they were a bit too, uh, monolithic and focused on on uh, on just providing either stoves or providing a fuel and not really looking enough at the big picture. So this is what we're trying to do. We've been working uh, on other projects that had, for example, subcomponents that included the delivery of uh, improved cook stoves, especially in some of our projects with EFAT. Uh, this is something that we've been doing. We've been working, of course, a lot with electrification, in including solar uh, mini grids, for instance. But now what we're trying to do is to capitalize on this experience to uh, really have a more, more focus on, on clean cooking, but from a more holistic standpoint. So unfortunately, I'm not really able to speak um, out of experience because it's a, it's a bit of a, of a new initiative. So we really want to, so from, from, this, uh, um, from these lessons learned uh, from, from many other partners, um, this is what 
made sense to us. We're, we're also working with a lot of UN agencies that are based in Madagascar and other traditional financing partners of ours, like IFAD, which I've just mentioned, but the World Bank also. And we're looking uh, maybe to uh, involve some of our more traditional partners from the from the uh, Gulf countries and, and uh, the African Development Bank down the road. But um, that's why we also have uh, set up an eight-year implementation period for the project, because we want to give ourselves the opportunity to be very flexible and agile, because that's the other challenge, is that if, if you come with a, a very rigid um, um, you know, mindset and you find um, conditions on the ground that are not conducive to your initial plan, you have to be quick on your feet. Maybe ethanol is not going to work in all regions. Maybe some uh, areas uh, will you know, absorb much better improved cookstoves, for instance, or uh, electric electricity. Um, so we need to be very flexible. And this is why we, we've designed the program to be super uh, flexible and agile, so that based on the local conditions, because from region to region, from village to village, the conditions can change very much, um, we, we, we are looking to really uh, adapt to what is going to be working on the long term. And of course, to make sure it works on the long term, um, it has to be profitable for the communities. So we need to um, engage with the private sector and with the communities in a way that it's going to be beneficial for everyone. And of course, the challenge with the private sector with such projects is that uh, it can be way too risky to to uh, just you know give it a shot and, and see if it's going to work or not, and that's the reason why um, part of the funding that we are uh, going to invest, and this is going to be in, in uh, partnership with agencies like UNCDF, the U United Nations Capital Development Fund, uh, will have uh, a programs of de-risking, uh, so that uh, you know some of the funding will help uh, these uh, private sector companies to you know take that extra risk knowing that uh as uh you know like first loss or or uh, uh you know type of of support or matching rents in some in some cases um they, they will have a safety net that will encourage them incentivize them to explore uh business areas that otherwise would, would not have been possible and last but not least uh, this initiative is also a partnership with uh, a joint SDG fund that was recently approved for $8 million in Madagascar that is going to be jointly managed by UNIDO, UNDP, and UNCDF. And uh, that will support, because I've seen, I think, one of the questions on the chat was uh, asking about uh, supporting innovation. Uh, one of the activities of this joint SDG fund is to support uh, an incubator uh, for innovative uh, renewable energy solutions. So um, we're definitely looking to, to support, um, you know, um, all these initiatives. We, what we'd like to do uh, to, to conclude is really to, to uh, build bridges between these small initiatives uh, that we felt could have had maybe more impact if um, uh, they were maybe looked at from, from a, let's say, higher ground, a broader perspective and um, a more holistic approach. So this is what we are uh, looking to implement with this very open mind, long implementation period to give us the, the, the possibility to do trial and error and uh, really try to, to um, adjust ourselves to the conditions uh, on the ground. So I hope this, this answered the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we haven't got much time left. We've got quite a few questions. I'll just throw a couple out to you and maybe whoever wants to take them uh, with just very brief answers. So someone asked about carbon finance, which I know several of you and in the previous session have mentioned. There was, however, a bit of a concern. How, how can a small company access carbon finance? Isn't it all very complicated? Who would like to uh, answer that one? Patience, you've... Uh, Maybe I'll, uh, I'll maybe I'll try to answer this. Um, so, as as part of the preparation of the project that we've been um, we've been working on, we've uh, potentially identified uh, a service provider that uh, might be able to uh, provide 
uh, a large scale um, feasibility study for um, carbon credits in some pilot regions. And once approved, any new uh, landholder that would that could be aggregated to this uh, to this study could potentially benefit from from the carbon credits. So that that's part of this approach that we're really looking at to to benefit from the edge of technology to uh, provide new solutions. So this is one of the ambitions of this of this project is really to capitalize as much as possible onto carbon credits and uh, to, to benefit from recent development in technology that can make it more approachable and accessible even to smaller uh, land uh, owners that don't have the resources to conduct the costly and time consuming um, uh, feasibility studies that are needed to, to benefit from them in the end. So this is definitely a, a, an important axis of, of, our, um, of our program. Excellent. And, and just to quickly, yes, Fabi. Yes, thank you. Just to quickly jump on that as well, we uh, over uh, over the years we've developed an innovative uh, carbon finance uh, mechanism that is local and is tailored made for most of the small comp for most of of our small companies that is playing in the clean energy space, either for for clean cooking or for solar lighting. So these programs comes under a POA program of activities that uh, we've already developed. So since inception, we've been able to draw down over $20 million of these funds. And these funds have also been able to help reduce the cost of providing our clean cooking to consumers and even our entrepreneurs, our green ambassadors. So this, fund, this money is paid directly to them because it also helps to offset their cost of distribution and the cost of assessing those remote areas. So for any of the companies or entrepreneurs that participate within our network, so they are covered just like uh, uh, Leo talked about now under the POA that, uh, that, we, that we've developed. So the methodology is available, so it's not that rigorous, but it's something that every small company can adapt to rather than paying heavy fund for consultants to be able to develop a new um, climate finance. Yeah, just to mention. Thank you. Um, there have been a couple of questions on the actual stoves as well, i.e. whether there are opportunities to produce those locally, whether there is a need for standards, is there much variation in terms of price or whatever? Is that something where there needs to be more work as well, or is that fairly straightforward? Anyone got experience yeah, of that? I, I think in most mm -hmm. in most markets in Kenya, in uh, Zambia, in the Gambia, in Ghana, in Nigeria, so we have the global uh, uh, clean cooking alliance uh, working with the local network. So they've also been engaging, uh, in which I'm also a member of the board in Nigeria uh, with local with government a policy maker. So. A whole lot of work I've, I've already gone into into that. So I think for any company that wants to manufacture any type of clean cooking stoves, it doesn't really matter if it's ethanol or or bequest or charcoal or any any clean cook stove. So there are standards today that can be complied with. So in Nigeria, for example, we work with a standard organization of Nigeria, and they are also testing uh, labs where having produce your cook stove, you can approach them for, for testing and for certification. Yeah, I think that already exists, but more can still be done. Any more thoughts on this? Patience? And in Ghana too, the Ministry of Energy is has developed- Sorry, can, can barely hear you. Can you go closer to the mic? In Ghana too, yes. uh, the Ministry of Energy also some no, it's still not working. Sorry. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on there. No, <laughs> we have a problem. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Barely. Okay. Um, 
let me see what else. Okay, there's various things. There was one question which I thought was quite funny to you, Femi. Why do you bother with uh, things that are so difficult to uh, work with, like water hyacinths? Okay, yeah, uh, I do get this question all, all the all the time. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Oh yes, so I do get the question all the time. Um, like I would always um, comment, um, different markets, different culture, different environment, different uh, um, level of development as well. So we have some very remote communities in Nigeria that even have electricity for cooking, but in the main city urban areas, you cannot afford to cook with electricity. So that means in remote communities where you have mini grids today, so you have cheaper access to cooking with electricity. So uh, ethanol cook stoves might not work in those communities, but they are able to use uh, electricity there. So our choice and preference for second and cellulosic ethanol, it's something that has to do with our uh, corporate uh, a vision and plan that we have to move away from um, any in any crop that is competing with food security and is intentional for, for us. And for long term, we've started this journey since 2011 and we've raised considerable amount in millions of dollars into the same technology. So we are structured and we are ready to develop and this emerging second generation biofuel. So while a lot of people can focus on first generation crop like cassava, sugarcane, molasses, and the likes that is already available, but don't forget, they also come with their equal volume of resistance and challenges. So you've heard my friend from Ghana, uh, from Kenya talking about the supply, the value chain in terms of you having to grow your crop yourself. You need to be a farmer to be able to produce ethanol from cassava or from sugar cane, if you are not. But I don't need to be a farmer to be able to harvest what I high scent. All I need to do is to partner with entrepreneurs and other farmers that will harvest this and deliver them to my, to my plant. So I only need to develop a collection program that will be able, I don't need to grow all the waste that I need to use to produce my ethanol. So it has its own advantages. But because a lot of because we have a proprietary around our conversion, that is what a lot of companies or people don't have, in which we've advanced. We've spent millions of dollars in our own R and D, and that is why we are sticking to uh, bioethanol from cellulosic. So it's a choice for us. But then a lot of other companies can focus on what works best in their community. Yeah. And also, of course, it is actually a problem in many water courses. So, you know, it's good to deal with. I, I just got to finish. I know we're out of time, but let me finish with one last one that was for Linda, which was actually asking about how you handle land acquisition for farming. But I mean, you are working with farmers, right? You're not going out trying to buy land yourself, I presume. No, that's a great question. Uh, we'd say typically, you know, we would, uh, you know, large scale production of ethanol such as ours would follow best practice from the global environment. And that typically is a nucleus farm and then smallholder farmers associated with that. So in our first project, we are going to have a larger component of the feedstock in an owned nucleus farm, so 60%. And that will provide a secure base load for the biorefinery. And then smallholder farmers will provide 40%. And the reasons for that are basically efficiency, right? Ethanol cooking fuel is a high volume, low margin. We have to absolutely provide it to Sophie, Coco Networks and the likes at the lowest possible cost. So efficiencies at production is absolutely critical. So with a nucleus farm, you're able to provide um, extension education, you're able to maximize yield, you're able to actually apply, apply good manufacturing practice. 
but the smallholder farmers then benefit. So with the larger and larger projects, then you can seed more production to smallholder farmers. So you can do a 50-50 owned, operate, owned operations and 50% smallholder farmers. And then you can keep reducing that as you go along because the community has been brought along, they've come along, they understand how to produce cassava, high yielding and very, very efficiently. How do you acquire land? With difficulty, but you do so anyway. Thank you, Linda. Okay. And well, thank you to all of you uh, for a really interesting session. It's a shame that we lost Telma halfway through, but at least we got, got part of the story. So I'd like to thank you all for attending, all well, the panelists and of course everyone else. We have a second uh, deep dive webinar on the 19th of April, as, and as I've already mentioned, this will focus on biodigesters, and there is a uh, registration link, but of course you can also find it on our website. And there'll be several more, so I hope we will get good attendance, and I hope we'll also get cross-sector stuff. I hope you know the bioethanol folks might learn something from the biodigesters and vice versa. Um, so great to kick it off with all of you, and we look forward to future discussions. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.